Oh, hi there. I'm playing the dance mats, or Dance Dance Revolution, or Dancing Stage as it's also been called. But why am I opening an episode with this? Well, because Konami. Konami. Hi there, Internet. I'm from the Internet and my name is Mr. Matt. On this latest serving of Pixels, we look at how Konami screwed up in the world of setting music to moving things in arcades and the home. Is Eurobeat really as violent as it sounds? What is this? But first, Dance Arts Revolution came out in Japan's arcades in 1998, with releases coming out in Europe and the US in 1999. The core premise is a four panel dance game where you stomp your feet in time to music and arrows who've decided that they don't like gravity and are floating off to a better reality. Well, unless you pop them with your feet. The game had steady releases until 2002, with the eighth mix dubbed Extreme, adding additional features as it got there, such as freeze arrows, higher difficulty, doubles charts, and flamethrower mode. During this time, the game exploded in popularity with references in the animes, TV, music videos, and other parts of popular culture. It also developed a dedicated fan base around the world, with online forums springing up to discuss the game, its music, how to get good, and also how to play at home, be it from the home releases, the subpar made for Europe releases, and the world of sim files. During the early days of people wanting to play more of the steady steps at home, there was a bit of software that was released called Dance with Intensity, which combined a file that contained arrows and an MP3 file which contained music. That's madness, right? This let people practice before hitting the arcades. Obviously, the legality was mm, dubious, but it was incredibly popular. However, a tale as old as time was about to begin a format war. Like VHS versus Betamax, HD DVD versus Blu-ray, Barry versus Gary, we saw Dance with Intensity versus Stepmania. Stepmania popped up, requiring a bit more beef to run, but with more features and easier customization. I'm making this sound like more of a war, but really it ended pretty quickly since Stepmania had support for the files Dance with Intensity used, whilst it didn't really work the other way around. Along with PCs getting the required beef to end up being able to run Stepmania with ease, Dance with Intensity sadly began to fade away. It'd be foolish of me not to end up bringing up some of the sim files that end up feeling more like boss battles or minigames. One of the best examples of this is Taro Nuke's Megalovania, which ends up feeling more like a boss battle against sands contained within Stepmania itself. This is fully playable on some machines as long as they've got the required beef to run it. I just really wanted to bring up Dance with Intensity because I never really hear about it these days and it was one of the gateways for me to get more into Dance Dance Revolution, especially during the early days. Um, it was really nice to end up being able to end up playing a lot of these old files and also I ended up getting a lot of the files, well, the MP3 files out of them and popping them onto a little MP3 player that I had. It was a wondrous time. Obviously, as DDR became more popular, other dance games started to spring up. Pump It Up, Billy Bear Ham Dance, and Easy To Dancer, to name a few. These continued to build up the market around dance games and brought different styles in presentation and play, along with different musical genres. A lot of people, their first dealings with K-pop uh, was actually through Pump It Up. In fact, I didn't know what K-pop was until I ended up playing Pump It Up in the arcades and going, what is this? With the boom in popularity and the demand still high, Konami decided to do what Konami do best and put the series into hibernation. After Extreme, there were some releases in the home and arcade, but these were typically just ticking things over without much innovation. Dancing Sage Fusion, for instance. Now, remember that Stemania thing that I ended up mentioning earlier? Well, only about 30 seconds ago. Well, given that we know how rabid fans minus more of the things that they like equals attempting to make more of the thing that they like, uh, unofficially, like recreations, finely laced doilies, or fan fiction, it was only a matter of time until they took things into their own hands. Now, home cabs had been a thing for a while, people getting older DDR or dancing stage machines and gussing them to put a computer with Stepmania on it. It allowed for people to end up being able to make a 
really bespoke custom machine for themselves, either for a venue or for their own personal use. They could end up including every single DDR mix, since when you ended up having DDR 6th mix, certain things from 5th, 4th, 3rd, 2nd and 1st ended up not being included. So this was a way for people to bring together everything that was Dance Dance Revolution, along with the home releases, and along with custom songs, all onto one machine. Now, these machines were amazing back in the day, and you'll actually also still find them pop up in random arcades or in people's private collections. This mentality became In The Groove, which was released by Red Octane and Roxor in 2004. It featured its own custom songs, it ended up having its own special theme, no arrows, ended up having a ton of new modifiers to end up really allowing players to customise their experience, along with saving their high scores to a USB stick, and also being able to end up putting their own custom charts for songs that were already on the machine onto a stick so that they can end up playing their own custom charts, or downloading new charts from featured creators all around the internet on those previously mentioned Dance Dance Revolution forums. Look at this crown! Playing this, I bet you they're going to end up being completely gassed uh, in just a few moments. Oh, wait a minute. I... Um, yeah, that's that's um, that's me. Um, this seemed to give a jolt back to the community, who were sorely wanting more Dance Dance Revolution, but instead they got in the groove, which for a lot of people ended up being just the thing they needed. As the skill level was increasing with every DDR release, in the groove ended up allowing players to end up having a new challenge. The old scale system for Dance Dance Revolution was 1 to 10. This introduced 13s, which were a lot harder than anything we'd seen on Dance Dance Revolution. There were some criticisms, obviously, of In The Groove, uh, some of them warranted, such as the gutting of old DDR and dancing stage machines to end up making these new In The Groove machines. Obviously, as you're removing the innards and you're replacing the banners to end up having a new product, you're losing the original machine, which could eventually end up being lost completely. So a lot of vintage machines, a lot of machines that had been in operation and circulation were now disappearing completely, with little chance of getting them back. Another criticism of In The Groove was the soundtrack, which was a lot more western than what DDR players were used to. There were licensed songs that would end up popping up in Dance Dance Revolution and Dancing Stage, but this was an entirely different style and genre of music, and some people didn't really like it. Um, some of the charts were not as high quality, but we'd also seen that on DDR to be fair. In The Groove was followed up with a sequel in 2005, bringing new improvements and dedicated hardware from the makers of Pump It Up and Amiro. It also saw updates to some machines to allow patches and improvements. But trouble was on the horizon. Konami was awakening from its slumber. Hmm, it's good thing actually. As In The Groove became more popular, and players were flocking from DDR to ITG due to the higher difficulty and improvements, Konami filed a lawsuit in Texas. Because of the likelihood of success in the courts there. They had quite a bit to go on in regards of the initial release of In The Groove. The modification of the original hardware of DDR was a murky area to begin with. However, it could be argued that depending on who owns the machine, it is technically within the rights of the owner to modify it. However, dedicated kits for the express purpose to modify another company's intellectual property is very iffy. Along with that, there was an argument to be made that DDR and ITG were too similar. So that would essentially mean that ITG were one-to-one -one ripping off DDR. Anyway, I'm not a lawyer, otherwise I wouldn't be doing this, and I would be doing law stuff and eating a regular breakfast. After a protracted battle with back and forth between Konami and Roxor, which was expanded to include the PlayStation 2 home release, it eventually resulted in In The Groove 3 being cancelled and Konami getting the rights to In The Groove in a settlement in 2006. Konami then started releasing some more arcade releases that were middling to decent, with Dance Dance Revolution Supernova in 2006 being a reasonable release, but after In The Groove brought improvements and expansions to the game it's felt, well, a bit meh. It had a lot of great songs from past releases and some new tracks, but had issues with the quality of the pads and the software. All in all, it just felt like Konami phoning it in after the competition. 
Later releases such as A20, which was released in July of 2020, have been great. Uh, there's been some new features added, they've ended up expanding the number of modifiers, uh, e-amusement supports, it, it seems like they've really ended up hitting their stride in actually making new and better hardware. To talk about the dark days of Dance Dance Revolution, here is the monk Kiko to end up discussing a little bit more. The dark days, yes, I remember them fondly. I would dance upon each device for hours upon hours, inexorably suffering, and for what? For those A's, those double A's, triple A's, dancing to the tune laid before me as if I were no more than a puppet for the Machine Master's will. I remember, as if I could taste the very dark heart itself pushing into my chest. I remember as if the words forever etched into my very stone. I remember. Dance, dance, revolution. Uh, now why did we go through this tale of Konami having a very popular product, which they then abandoned, brought back after competition, started showing them how they left money on the table? Because it's Konami. And this is what Konami do again and again. Not just in the dance and rhythm game section, they do this a lot. Jim Sterling has already covered Konami's other properties being misused or forgotten about, resulting in money being effectively left on the table for some of these properties. I've even covered a previous tale of this with Treasure, and how they were formed out of frustration from Konami not wanting to expand their horizons, producing Gunstar Heroes, Dynamite Heady and others. This is obviously a one-time deal. Konami don't have any other history of botching it slightly with one of their rhythm action type. Oh, wait, of course. Dance Dance Revolution was part of the Bimani music line, which included other titles which had music as their primary focus. The reason why it's called Bimani is because of their first ever release under this title, Beat Mania. Beat Mania uh, allowed players to end up standing in arcades and tapping some little keys, along with spinning a disc. Uh, the first edition ended up having five keys, whilst later on they ended up expanding it to Beatmania 2DX or IIDX, which ended up including seven keys and the spinning pad, and Beatmania 3, if memory serves me right, which ends up having a pedal, which allows you to end up stomping and playing the keys like this, like this, like this, like this. There were some machines that got overseas along with importing the arcade style controllers and home releases, but nothing official. So Activision released their own version called DJ Hero, which had some changes over 2DX. Different focus, it's more on the mixing of two different songs, and it ends up only having three keys which are situated on the actual platter itself. But it had some inspiration from the Konami release. It had a shaky start, but overall did a right in the long run. But what about this? The Guitar Heroes or the rock bands. Surely there couldn't have been anything Konami made that was like this. Well, obviously, since I'm bringing it up now, yeah. Yeah. Guitar Freaks, or as it's also known as Gitadora, is a title that initially featured three frat buttons and a strum bar. It, like most of the entries on this list, and also coming up, wasn't released outside of Japan. Although machines did sometimes find their way overseas. Guitar Freaks was actually the inspiration for Guitar Hero. A lot of the soundtrack for Guitar Freaks was definitely very Japan-centric, and it ended up leveraging heavily on Bimani's more rock-based offerings. It ended up not really having an appeal that would end up catching fire outside of Japan. Of course, to go along with Guitar Freaks was Drum Mania. Now, does anyone want to have a little guess as to what that might be about? Drums. Obviously, drums. What was really awesome was that whilst the arcade cabinets could be played solo, they could also be linked up to play together, giving an early precursor to Rock Band. I wonder if there was another instrument that could be added to that. We'll come back to that in a sec. Guitar Hero, of course, would also introduce drums and vocals to their offering. Rock Band and Guitar Hero were part of the golden age of selling plastic instruments to Xbox 360, PlayStation 3 and Wii owners. One of the best things about these titles was the constant building up of a song library, which you develop with previous titles, add-on games, and DLC. By the time the later titles were released, some players had hundreds of songs available, 
although I am still bitter that here Comet Alex wasn't actually ported over from Rock Band 1 Europe into the Rock Band 2 or Rock Band 3 or Rock Band 4. But what happens if these plastic instruments start to get a bit iffy? What happens if you can't be bothered to dig them all out and put batteries in them, have to remember how your fingers work? Well then, Rock Band actually released a title that was really, really useful. It utilised your song library and allowed you to end up enjoying a different dimension to your music that was already on there. Oh, of course, talking about Rock Band Blitz. Rock Band Blitz was released in 2012 on Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3. It has gameplay like Harmonix's other titles, Frequency and Amplitude. You switch between the different tracks generated from the guitar, bass, vocal, keys and drum tracks. Competitively, the boards popped up on the side whilst playing for a bit of friendly competition. It added a new dimension for getting access to your music library. Plus, it added some additional songs into Rock Band 3. One of the other awesome things about Rock Band Blitz was it also allowed you to play the Rock Band Network stuff. Rock Band Network was a indie way of being able to end up releasing songs that wouldn't normally get released as Rock Band DLC proper. So this allowed people to play stuff from Weeble, Devin Townsend, and even Discord. Before you end up picking a song, you can end up putting on different modifiers, such as a pinball mode, you could end up having a flaming notes mode, having a amplification of certain instruments, or just all the instruments as you switch between them, based in an AI-controlled bandmate who would just end up taking over one of the lanes for you. There are a ton of extra little features that you can end up putting on there. It really was a great release. Sadly, it is no longer available to buy. Music licensing striking again which sadly is one of the reasons for a lot of the previously mentioned titles not being released outside of their region. Unfortunately, because of the year being 2020, a lot of the additional online features are now completely broken or will end up kicking you out of the game completely within a few seconds of starting it. As we can see from this footage, I was attempting to capture a lot more gameplay of Rock Band Blitz, but unfortunately it kept booting me back out or not allowing me to put on modifiers. I really hope that we end up seeing Rock Band Blitz 2 at some point, maybe for the new Series X, Series S, PS5, just so that we can end up having our old libraries back again. Um, it's really sad that they haven't ended up putting it back. I mentioned keys as part of Rock Band Blitz. Well, that's because keys were introduced into Rock Band 3. Now, you can already guess how this is going to go, because I previously mentioned that there might be another thing that was introduced that would end up connecting up to Guitar Freaks and Drum Mania. Yeah, Keyboard Mania, if you hadn't already guessed that that would be the name of the title. Of course, Konami had Keyboard Mania, which featured a full-size MIDI keyboard. Oh, and it also connected to the previously mentioned Guitar Freaks and Drum Mania. Whilst well, Guitar Freaks and Drum Mania still end up seeing some releases, Keyboard Mania was sadly cancelled. But what about the dance? What about the dance? Oh, the dance was covered by Dance Central, which was a Kinect title that let users dance and get on down to the music stuff. Dance Central was an awesome little game, but of course you already realised that I was actually going to move on to Konami in a second, weren't you? Of course, Konami had their own offerings, which was something called Para Para Paradise, which I'm led to believe ends up utilising a dance style called Para Para. Now, if memory serves me right, Para Para Paradise was actually a song by that band Coldplay, I think it is. I'm not too sure about that. Whilst Dance Central used full body scanning via Connect. Para Para Paradise used a series of sensors to track movements. When Para Para dropped out of popularity, the title was sadly cancelled. There is a twist on this one, however. As I ended up mentioning that there was Dance Central released for the Kinect, Konami got in on the action as well. They ended up releasing a title called Dance Evolution, which ended up building on the work they had done with Para Para Paradise, utilising Para Para dance styles to end up having the songs go to a Para routine. The problem with this, however, is that they end up leaning too heavily on the Vimani and the actual Parrot style. So whilst the title was fun, there was nothing there for Joe Average to latch onto, eventually resulting in it being just forgotten about. There was an actual arcade release for this as well, which ended up utilising a form of the Kinect sensor. However, since 2016 they've cut off EMU's support, so the title is no longer supported. With her memories of Dance Dance Revolution and other titles, here's Melissa. Okay, so a couple games I wanted to talk about. The first one I actually want to talk about was the first dance game that I played, and that was Buster Groove, so the PlayStation 1. And I loved Shorty, she was my favourite character. She used to wear these dungarees, these, these, um, the black 
and red striped top and I used to think that was me I used to think that was me I used to be like that's so me with my little cap <laughs> and this like I think he had, she had like this cuddly toy or something she used to carry around with, I don't know um, but yeah I must have completed that game over 10 times um, I knew the lyrics to the songs and yeah it was a fighting game as well so I kind of like that concept it wasn't just dancing it was fighting um, and you're battling out that way so yeah really like that one um, and then of course Dance Dance Revolution um, I'm pretty sure everyone else is going to talk about Dance Dance Revolution um, and how they used to <laughs> jump over the bars and through them and I don't know if anyone else used to try and do it backwards on the dance pads but I, I definitely did I definitely did I wasn't successful with it <laughs> most times but I used to think I was pretty badass but I don't have a video of me um, so you're just gonna have to imagine how pretty cool I was doing that um, but yeah I can't I can't even count how much money I must have spent on those dance machines I say money I spent but really that was my mom's money whoops um, <laughs> and yeah I lost a lot of weight I lost a lot of weight and I think that's why I loved it so much is because I really it did make it was a life-changing experience for me as well it wasn't just a game it was something that was keeping me active it was a hobby a newfound hobby that I realized was helping me to lose weight so yeah those are my two games and only made a lot of type great titles with the Bimani line with their charm the music the style the characters and the fan bases that came up it became part of the most interesting bubbles of selling plastic things to console owners, but they never ended up capitalising on the work they'd done in the arcades overseas during this time. As a result, I feel that Konami ended up really missing a lot of money here. If they had ended up getting their first with Guitar Freaks over Guitar Hero, if they had ended up bringing in the synchronised style of having Guitar Freaks, Drum Mania, Keyboard Mania all together, they could have ended up beating a lot of people to this. It can be argued that the technology wasn't there, but this was Konami. They were used to making arcade style stuff already. They'd made the 2DX arcade style controller. They already know that people ended up having dance mats from you know the early 2000s onwards. They could have ended up getting a lot more money if they hadn't ended up completely botching localization or not localizing at all. As we saw with Dance Evolution, the problem is, is that they probably would have leaned more into the style that would have ended up serving the Japanese audiences more than trying to get more wide market appeal. We've seen what happens with the releases of dancing stage games. The licensed songs end up typically not being that great, and along with that, the charts are usually bilge. Overall, Konami might just be the kings of really not understanding what their own properties are worth. Who am I kidding, of course? Konami is eventually going to end up moving their entire B money line to end up being pachinko machines as well, aren't they? When I was younger and I had more hair, a lot more hair, to be fair, um, I ended up playing a lot of Dance Dance Revolution. I ended up meeting a lot of great people through that. I ended up having a lot of drinks, a lot of fun, a lot of laughs. But as time moves on, unfortunately, you end up moving on from those sorts of things. I still play Dance Dance Revolution every now and again, but I moved heavily over to Rock Band, where I ended up playing a lot with probably one of the greatest groups ever, the Pink Fond of Fancies. However, that's a story for another day. Or never. So that's uh, series two, episode two. Um, thank you so much for watching. Um, it's been great going through a lot of the old Bimani titles, um, as well as digging out DJ Hero, playing a bit of Rock Band, a bit of Rock Band Blitz. Um, this has actually been a really fun episode to make, but it's also been a real challenge. Um, it just took a lot longer than I was expecting to edit. Uh, massive thanks to Melissa, uh, Kiko, and um, Sean or S34N um, for allowing me to use some of his footage. Um, it's been absolutely great going through a lot of this stuff. Um, hopefully see you again very, very soon.